Are we, are we, oh, we're live now. Now we're live? All right. Welcome, everybody, to the fourth round. We're still going. <laughs> going strong. And, uh, yeah, let's kick things off with Matt's ring. Matt's Anderson from uh, – he is from Norway. I would very much like to take this opportunity to formally apologize because uh, this morning on our newsletter announcing this event, I totally told our – I think close to 300 email subscribers that this man was from uh, Ireland and he's not from Ireland. So sorry, bro. <laughs> he is definitely from Norway. Okay. But uh, super, super cool guy. And uh, just been a, a big supporter of everything that we've been doing guys. So um, he, he's been, he's been in, I, I think every single time so far, but anyway, he goes um, question for the live tonight behind the neck presses and pull downs stupid or a recipe for injuries or a smart move i would definitely say all of the above to some degree <laughs> uh what do you guys think i would say it depends on how healthy your, your rotator cuff is if your rotator cuff is, is healthy and you've got good flexibility and mobility there then by all means do it but i wouldn't go too far down i think when you're going too far down that's going to put an awful lot of strain on, your, on the back of your shoulders I think when it when it comes to shoulder, especially the shoulders, um, a lot of people tend to go down way too low behind the neck, and that can put an awful lot of strain, pretty much in this muscle right here, which is the rotator cuff. So then, basically, when you put yourself in that when you put yourself in that awkward position, putting the hands behind you, I think you can you can be in a lot of trouble then going forward. Yeah, um, my kind of standpoint is if the weight is behind you and you're doing a shoulder press. It's not going to follow a natural range of motion that's going to be easy for your shoulder joint to deal with. Um, I'm not just talking about the actual shoulder joint on the clavicular portion. I'm talking about the way the actual shoulder, your, um, what would you call it? How it rotates on the back side of things. Now, if your shoulders are pinched back and that's going to pinch your shoulder blades together, then that limits the range of motion of those individual joints. So it means you're actually working against yourself to lift that weight, which means you're going to be potentially weaker well you're, you're going to be weaker because it's not using uh, a more natural movement mm -hmm. pattern um, the risk of injury is much higher i personally don't advocate for it um, now people say it's good and it builds up more muscle but it's they sort of use the example that using more muscle fibers because it works all three heads of the side well the side and rear delt of the um, shoulder but the problem is you can isolate these movements individually and these with different exercises um, so i'll probably look at using Rather than doing maybe two or three sets of behind the neck shoulder press, I might do one or two of the front, um, just a front shoulder press or a more of a maybe neutral if you've got some sort of equipment that allows that. Then, of course, add in some rear delt movement and a side delt movement. Um, I think you're working against yourself. I mean, if you're pushed for time and you can do it safely, it's worth a try, but I don't see much progression when you're left with that. Um, I wouldn't advise for it, but, you know, three different answers, three different guys. Take your pick. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely so uh my opinion on behind the neck press is, is it's a great move for muscle building and i think we would all agree but it's just you got to look at risk and reward is is it is it really worth it because you are definitely putting yourself at risk for some sort of a shoulder injury um, in particularly in particular a rotator cuff um, I'm just going to be completely honest when we, I, I've been doing behind the neck presses, um, all through my, all through my bodybuilding ever since I read about it. And, um, in Steve Reeves book, um, have you got, have you guys read Steve Reeves book? You know who Steve Reeves is, right? He was, was yeah, yeah. Mr. Universe before, Ar before Arnold was. And, um, he was a big, big, big advocate of training wide to be wide. So wide behind the neck presses, wide upright rows wide pull downs all that kind of stuff i mean this guy's he ha he has like the smallest waist in all of bodybuilding history right this is before the golden era even which is kind of what inspired the golden era um but behind the neck presses was his bread and butter and so when the judges told me that shoulders were a weak point um that was something that i really took to heart and something that i ever since then it was just you know how they say that the day that you start lifting is the is is the day that you're forever small <laughs> and so so, so the last uh, I don't know seven eight years that I've been competing, um, it's been it's been it's been a staple. It really really has. Um, if my shoulders can move, they're getting hit. If my quads can move, they're getting hit. Um, 
and actually it was a couple mornings ago woke up to like the best compliment of my life my wife was like your 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 shoulders have grown i'm like wow like that's all i needed to hear like <laughs> like i that that just set the tone for the entire day and i was like heck yeah um but it's you know to to be able to isolate the side delt yeah it's all about the side laterals um and it's all it's all about more of the pulling movements but to be able to have a press to where you can overload it and give it a little more weight um from a muscle building perspective yeah it's 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 helpful but um but at what cost um i am dealing with shoulder shoulder injuries right now you know i dislocated it playing hockey and so that makes it flare up from time to time um but I would rather have bigger shoulders and have them hurt from time to time <laughs> than uh, than have small than have smaller shoulders and have them be and have them be perfectly safe. But anyway, but but I know that there's healthier methods to pressing than behind the neck presses. Um, do you do you guys ever mess around with uh, with Bradkin presses where you're pressing to the front and then to the back and going back I, and forth? I do, I do that. With, I do that with bands when I'm getting when I'm getting warmed up. Like if I'm ever doing a chest day or a shoulder day, I'll always do that. I'll always get like a little thick bands and go press behind. Just get the shoulders nice and warm. Get the chest nice and warm. Open up the chest a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I, I find that works amazing. Just going with the shoulders as well. I find that when you work the shoulders in high rep ranges, I find I find that works very very well. Mm -hmm. Um, like I'm talking about like twenty plus, like for laterals, rear, rear delts. Um, and I'm I'm a big fan of taking the set like to be on failure. Now, so let's say you're doing an active range of motion of a lateral raise, you can't lift that weight anymore. I'll do a I'll do a set of partials and then I might do a hold at the end. So the set might go on for about ninety seconds. So I'm completely annihilating the shoulder. Like I cannot lift anymore. Um, and then I know then when I go into a pressing movement. If we like, if I if I put like fifteen kg on like a sixteen, that that feels really really heavy, because I've mm -hmm. I've really destroyed my shoulders from the first exercise. Yeah, your perception of pain will be higher if you're doing high repetitions, especially if you're using um, a, a lesser compound weight. So, for example, we know we could squat a heavy weight, we could deadlift heavy weight, we could row heavy weight, um, chest press, bench press, whatever you like. A shoulder press it will never be quite as heavy as the other weights so we can almost use a high repetition range and feel more of a burn yep. um the only objection i have with that is if someone for example is using that 20 repetition range but then flinging it up i know mark knows exactly what i'm talking about um so if you're doing 20 repetitions it's not you're doing 20 repetitions in the span of time that it takes you to do 10. um it should near enough be about the same amount of time. Um, and the force reps are good as well. Any kind of intensifier, so a set to extend will be useful as well. Yeah, um, yeah the, the caveat here for me, just to what Mark said, was if you're going to do it, do it with the same level of intensity, effort, strictness, and form as you would the lower repetition ranges. Yeah, and and, and that's a good point because, as I said, when, when it comes to that like main set, I'll always like try and pretty much just take that complete set to complete failure. Um, I, I know that if I was to do, like, say, four sets of 20 reps, obviously I wouldn't get the same value of doing four sets. I just find that if you, if you let's say, if you have it, like, when, when I mean, like, a, a light set of 20, I mean, like, literally, it, it could be anything. It could be a rest pause. It could be a drop set. It could be uh, more focused on the negatives. You're just doing one all-out set, but I think that, I find that when I'm doing, especially a lot of rates, it, unless I'm unless I'm controlling the negative, I probably won't feel until probably after the ninth, eighth or ninth rep, and that's when that starts. Whereas if I lift the weight up and then really focus on bringing it down nice and slowly, then yeah, I might feel after one or two. So it all depends. But I like like at the very very beginning, I like to go at the very very end that we're we're actually weaker at the end. So I'll go with a heavy weight and I'll just do partials out to the sides. I'll maybe do about maybe a set of 50 in there. Then I'll bring the weight up to about maybe here. I'll do another here. And then at the end, then I'll just probably just hold the weight with the, with the heaviest weight. I'll just hold it as much as I can. And at that at this point now, I just, I'm just i trying to hold it as much as I possibly can, close my eyes and try to like, in this position is right here. When I'm finished that, believe me, my shoulders are in bits after that, trust me. <laughs> 
hundred percent. Um, I'm on page 272 of Arnold Schwarzenegger's Bodybuilding Encyclopedia. <laughs> you guys have oh, both read gosh. that one, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's a there's a picture here of Flex Wheeler doing behind the neck presses with almost four plates, guys. <laughs> um, that's that's kind of the exception to the rule. Um, yeah, no, my shoulder training is never, ever, ever, ever um, heavy. There's, I think there's a time and a place for for push presses, but uh, but I 100% agree with you, especially when you're going behind the neck. I mean, it's all there's there's absolutely no reason to um, to use that kind of weights. But uh, just for the record, Flex Wheeler is my favorite physique of all time, uh, and and he and he, um, I mean that was that was a that was a method that more so he used. But this whole but this whole chapter on on shoulder development is, I mean, he Arnold walks you through every kind of basically every kind of variation that you can do with the, with the behind the neck press drop sets, um, basically everything. So anyway, I just want to throw that. Out there. I also think that when you look at nowadays, like a lot of things have changed in the last 20 or 30 or even 40 years. Yeah. Like everybody will always say that, or even if you look at the, if you look at the bodybuilders, like from years ago, they all focused on bench press, pull-ups and bent over rows, deadlifts. And they said, yeah, this is the best way to build muscle. That might suit them, but it won't suit like the likes of me. So yeah. I might I mightn't get the right connection out of say a bench press than I would out of a machine press, or I might get a, a better connection out of lifting a dumbbell into a press machine. It's all about like what fine what works best for you. So if you feel you've got good mobility, good flexibility, and you feel like yeah, I can actually do the hunt behind the neck presses, then by all means go ahead and do it. Um I just as I said, just be a little bit safe. I wouldn't go down too far. I'd be, I completely, um, completely agree with Jonathan. I wouldn't print someone else's program just for that reason alone, just the safety, safety elements. But if I was um, putting into someone's program, I definitely wouldn't go down too low. I think that's going to put an awful lot of strain on your shoulders. Hundred percent. Yeah, and and this is something that I wanted to uh, mention and just throw out there. On to, to be completely honest, as, as a coach, this is a big regret of mine. Is um, I, I've been as when I first started coaching, I had everybody b doing behind the neck presses because that's what was working for me. And that's what I knew. And so that's what I was teaching. And um, especially when we started training more kind of like your um, uh, kind of like who you specialize in coaching, Mark, which is like uh, ladies ages uh, 40, 40 to 60. Um, there's there's a difference between being able to handle a whole bunch of weight behind your head or even or, or even just a steel bar with not a lot of weight behind your head as a 20 year old kid. Now I'm 31. And every time I do, I'm like, I know they're going to hurt. And so the CBD is definitely key <laughs> for, for me. I can see you rolling your eyes. Sorry about that. I know. But, uh, but I, I'm always trying to push past the pain, man. <laughs> just uh, if I, if I, if I risk an injury, then I don't know, I guess that's on me. But, um, but you know, obviously there's a lot more that needs to be taken into consideration when someone else's health and someone else's safety is, is, is in your hands really. And so it was, uh, um, a couple, a couple phone calls of, Hey, my shoulder's really starting to hurt where Mark, you and I had to, had to, had to get on, had to get together and start looking at, um, more safer ways to, to, to go about doing these pressing variations. Um, but what, but just a couple other thoughts, guys, uh, Matt's in particular, um, things, things to try in the gym, um, machines, <laughs> shoulder, the shoulder pressing machine is really, really underrated. I mean, I'm just talking about the dumb machine that's not even made for bodybuilders. It's just it's it's a it's an overhead pressing machine, and you can have your hands uh, depending on it either for either forward or um, to the side depending on how the handles are shaped. Um, but I'm the guy that always gets on there backwards and uh, facing the machine, kind of with your face, and it's it's gross because like your nose is by everybody's sweat and everything from whoever was on before, but. Uh, but 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 you get but you get in there and you turn your pinkies out and your thumbs in so like kind of over pronate your hands um, and you can use a very 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 small amount of weight um, focus on think about what's happening inside inside your shoulders okay there uh, th think of take uh, take into consideration what bones the side deltoids are working on. So if you so if your goal is to grow your side deltoids and your rear del deltoids, which it should be on a shoulder day, I mean if you're doing bench press at any point or doing any kind of chest work, you pr you, you can probably check the front deltoid box. You don't need to isolate it for 99% of people. Um, but to hit that side delt and the rear delt. It's all, it's all about the wrist angle. And the more that you can over pronate your wrist, you can do it right now and just like look at, put your arm out in front of you. 
if you have your hands supinated, it's easy to remember supinated versus pronated. Supinated is like you're holding a cup of soup. You don't want to tip it over because you'll spill it, right? Pronated is when your hand is facing down, um, like in a prone position. Like if you're going to shoot something in a prone position, I don't know. That's how that's how I remember it. Um, and so, if you when you pronate your hand, the further you go, you can see your rear deltoid and your side deltoid start to move and come on top of your shoulder. That moves your humerus. So your um, and and not your not your clavicle. Okay. So when you're doing any kind of a behind, behind the neck press um, or this one in, 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 in particular, if, you, if, you, if you're using dumbbells or anything where you're pressing over your head, if you use more of that wrist position, you're going to favor more of the side and rear deltoid. So when I hit this machine, um, facing the machine, I over pronate my hands. It's tough on the wrist, but, uh, but, I, but I can typically lock out if it's a converging machine so that I, don't, so I'm, so I have constant tension the entire time. The barbell, if I lock out, I lose my tension there. But the machine, like Life Fitness or Hoist or whatever, any of them, um, the, it's kind of all the same idea with the weight stack. Face the machine and get your freaking uh, 12, 15 high reps in, drop the pin, do, an do another one. I mean, that's a real quick, easy drop set, and your shoulders are torched after that. And you, it, and you, and you don't need to have a big ego and see who can press as much as, as much weight as they can over your head. I don't know. I'd rather I'd, ra I'd rather look, I'd rather – I'd, I'd rather have bigger shoulders that look better than be the guy, than be the guy that's always snapping. I'm just throwing weight around. That's why I do bodybuilding, not CrossFit. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Good cool. points. Yeah. Uh, so Matt's also asked about behind the neck pull downs. That's a controversial one. What do you guys think? Uh, thumbs up or thumbs down for that exercise? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd be the same. I'm yeah, just I, I agree. There's, there's like no, there's every scientific article that I that I've seen shows that there's no more lat activation if you pull behind the neck. You can't pull as much weight. You, there's no way to do it comfortably. It, eh, I'm I'm not a fan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, the only all, thing I'll say, all... um, I won't expand on this at all because we're, we're all in disagreement. Um, the only thing I'll say, which take about a minute to say, is basically, if you force your muscle groups into position, so, for example, pinch your shoulder blades back, so it's behind you. You'll feel your lower trapezius muscles and rhomboids activate more. You'll feel them more because mm. they're unnaturally pinched together. Those yeah. muscles will not activate more. They're being pinched. Therefore, it gives you the perception that they're working harder. But if you actually measured the muscle activity on them, um, it would not be any higher than doing, for example, a row, which we know is a more of a mainstay movement of working the mid-back. And so it gives you that artificial kind of feeling that it's working your, your traps, but it doesn't but the same way you'll see it visually as well you'll, you'll see people doing pull downs on um i don't know twitter or tiktok what people use nowadays and i have a top off and i will do behind the neck you'll see all these muscles tweaking in and out and what's the thing it look, looks good but it's not working the muscles more um because it's no. not the function of the muscle the muscle is uh, almost like a butterfly it's like a like that like um, a can opener sort of thing it's not a i can't even it doesn't work that way muscles don't the muscle fibers don't align that way so um that's one right little caveat there as well well you know what jonathan i i think you're right at, at, at the at the at the end of the day if you if you make any muscle group move differently and do and pull from a different angle do it it's just anything to make it um to make it guess then i can i can totally see why that would be a great idea yeah i've i okay low key i've done them from time to time it's just not something that i'd really recommend because i don't see as much use for it as the standard pulling, uh, standard pull down, and standard rows, and that kind of thing. Yeah, you I'm, know, I'm, they touch I'm a, as well. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of doing. I'm a big fan of doing pull down single arm. If I'm ever doing the lats or the traps or anything like that, I find uh, single arm works best for me. And um, you very, very rarely see me on a lat pull down. Very, very rarely. I find you can get more connection when you're doing like a pull down on a one arm, like say, like. Kind of like a lever, it's kind of like this, like kind of like an L shape. You're pulling the elbow down towards the hip. You're leaning into it. You're, you're kind of pushing your down towards your hip, and you're really focused. So in that position, then your lats are already under tension. It's just about now shortening to shorten the range. So it's just driving the elbow down, and that one after the first rep, like I mean, I can feel literally all on my right side, like all on fire. Um, the likes of the pull downs, I haven't done, I haven't done a pull down and. Oh my God! Two or three years. Um, my my favorites would be you now as I said single single arm pull down, 
or maybe I'll do my pull up or I, I just done one there during the week as well where I'll, I'll elevate my feet on a bench and I'll hold on to um, a Smith machine and I'm pulling myself up that way as well. But I'd always put that pretty much at the end of my workout. Um, An inverted uh, row because you're using yeah. body weight. Yeah. 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 And you can and you can add a plate. You can put a plate on your on your lap if you want. You add a, add a bit more resistance. I find that when I add, when I add in like say two or three exercises, my back's on fire. I just need a finisher at the end, and I'm trying to pick between that and like a pull up. I find that the, the pull up machine on the on the Smith machine works absolutely top notch. Yeah, I like that exercise as well. It's a it's a great finisher if you've got something in the tank and you're able to um, recover from the extra volume. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Jonathan, I just sent you a message in the private chat. I found, I, I found an article about um, pull downs versus rows. I just wanted to throw this at the, I just wanted to throw this out there um, to wrap sure. up on back training just in general. Um, this, this, this study says that when subjects did seated cable rows, muscle activity, the lats was more than 40% greater than when they did wide grip pull downs. Rows appeared to be a better exercise for stimulating more of the lat fibers and therefore helping to build a bigger back. So when it comes to back training in general, yeah, my suggestion would be to take a step back and it should be mostly yeah. rows and less pull downs. But both of them are great moves. Yeah, yeah I, I think if we look at the lats as well, um, the way they insert, they kind of insert around, around, then they go sort of downwards. Um, so the idea is we didn't don't just do so what Colt's saying here is don't only do rows. He's saying maybe do two row movements and one pull down movement or something like that. And um, we find yeah. that when we're actually doing a wide grip lap pull down. So the the idea was that Steve Reeve said back in the day, the wider you go, the you know, the wider your back will be. We know that's not true. Um the weight we can use. There's some row. merit to it, but there's definitely <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I, I agree with you on that. Go ahead. Yeah, so it'll work the muscles. Um the intricate muscles below the rear delt. Um, for the life of me, I can't remember. It's quite late here, but um, you know the, the intricate muscles below that. So when you go like that in the, the rear pose, you got some slight little like curvatures in your um, your back muscles. You have got the lats at the bottom. So the lats are going to build up. I believe it's something like I want to say about seventy percent of the muscle in your back is in the lats. Um, you can effectively work your lats low, medium, probably up to about here. Maybe near enough 90 degrees until your, your elbow to your hip. And that works your lats very well. And then as soon as you go up to about 90 degrees or around up there, you work more of your mid back. Um, I think it depends also on where your elbow lands in relation to your back as well. Um, you'll be stronger in some positions compared to others. If you're doing a wide grip row, you can't really see my hands, but if very wide, uh, you'll be weaker because you've got less muscles to actually pull. Whereas if it's close to your body, um, your muscles work more naturally in that position. So imagine you're out in nature, you're trying to pour a bunch of logs. You're not going to pull it with like a, arms out here. You're going to be too weak. Nothing's going to move. You know, get as close as possible to your body and bring it in as far as you can um, using the primary movers, which are going to be the lat muscles. Depending if, also if you're bent, bent over or upright, if you're trying to pull down or across. So I think for most pulling movements, it's um, generally for most people, it's a narrow, well, a medium narrowish sort of, uh, grip so it might be I wouldn't say here I'd say somewhere between like here and here for me um, about shoulder width so mm. good stuff guys mm. yeah and I think the same goes for when you're doing like a dumbbell row a lot of people will always row the dumbbell it's like in this position right here it's not like it's kind of like it's not like a like a lever position like an like an L shape like this like a lot of people will just get grab the weight and they're just row. So they're using a lot of traps and not a lot of rhomboids. They're going more for thickness. And um, when you're doing, when you're trying to really focus on the lats, it's not about like pulling the weight up really, really hard. It's kind of like an, it's kind of like a motion. Like you're you're pushing the weight out in front of you, and then you're, if anything, you're driving, you're you're trying to drive the dumbbell right down to the hip, and it, you don't need to go too far. So it's just getting it's getting a full stretch, and then getting a full connection as you come up as well. Yeah, I'm quite a fan of um, trying to think of the right terminology for it. Diverging pull downs, I believe they're called, and diverging rows. So, yeah, the ones I, that pull I, I'm up not a fan of. Like yes, yeah, so I'm not a fan of machines which are just straight back and forward or straight up and down. I like mm -hmm. something with a slight element of. Um, it works your muscles more. 
and also because you can actually resist against you can use your, the side of your hands almost like grip it and resist when you're pulling something apart to activate more of the muscles on the outside um, air of the back as well so there's little tri tricks you can use which you get you, you pick up these things as you get more advanced and you learn how to do it it just takes time I think that's a good point as well, actually, because I remember that. I remember someone telling me that, like, when I remember you're doing a row, before you pick the bar up, try and pull the bar as far as you can. So when you when you grab the bar, imagine you're pulling it out of the figure. If you're to match that bar, do exactly what Jonathan said, rowing it. It, it spreads and that's when you get the connection force and then you start rowing and then uh, it's just an incredible it's incredible incredible feeling. Mm. yeah definitely i'm gonna check the chat to see if we've got any questions from anyone unless you guys have any that have been asked from your guys so we got lots of comments i don't see any questions though oh mm. uh young fox says hey colt just watched your wife on steven's channel great interview thanks bro <laughs> um someone says yeah oh yeah you know what I, I think we i think we've missed a handful of questions actually sorry guys jonathan do you see the questions bro no i don't see much of mine in terms of questions hmm. no i can wonder, only wonder what I... box okay looks like we got about Thanks for all the support, everybody. <laughs> like twenty comments. Give us some topics, guys. Give give us some questions. Something to uh, something to work with, if you if you don't if you don't mind. Whatever whatever you got. Otherwise, um, I was gonna run a. Oh, yeah. Hey, and and th and thanks so much, Young Fox. Whoever you are for saying that about my wife. Um, to be completely honest, it's a dream come true for both of us. You know, um, both of us met playing hockey ten years ago, and. Um, she was an athlete when I met her and I was an athlete when she met me, got married, had kids, went into business for ourselves um, on online and got jobs and everything. And then kind of lost that part of that part of ourselves. So I started going to the gym, got into bodybuilding and she started going to the gym and got into bodybuilding. And it's great because we can be parents and it's uh, it's more dynamic. You know, we're not like nailed down to a team schedule or anything. So um, it's been a good move for both of us. But yeah. Thanks so much for saying that. That's, uh, that's, that's super nice of you. Okay, I'm calling have... I'm calling both you guys out, by the way. So tomorrow I've got a YouTube video um, I'm posing. Um, it's unedited, unfiltered, no specialist lighting. Um, I want you guys to watch it. Then I want you to post your version of your own, like, um, quarter turns and mandatory poses. I'm down. Hey, but you have to let me use my own lighting, though, because... My lighting is special lighting. optimized. <laughs> yeah, I got it. I got all my lights set up in the right angles, bro. And then when I step out of the house, I just like I look. I just look like a normal dude the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah, Mark actually inspired me to do this. Yeah, I've been hoping. doing it for quite a while as it is. So sounds great. Yeah, I'm up for that. All right, so it's gonna be. It, it's it's gonna. Are we gonna? We're, we're gonna record it ourselves. It's not gonna be like a live or anything, right? No. So just post it on your Instagram or something. Um. If you want me to make a video of it or something, I can do that for you guys. I don't mind. Okay, you do the first one. You tag me, and I'll do the same thing. Yeah, we'll do that. Brilliant. Good stuff. All right, everybody listening, uh, follow us on Instagram because you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna see, you're gonna see, see a, a competition. Bulges and, and boxes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got a question here. We here. Go. Um, Joe asked, leg workout for male with hip replacement, no legs. No, sorry, no leg press, conventional deadlifts, or RDL. Possible. Hmm. Um, I don't do any of those. Um, I do some leg presses, actually, to be fair. But one way you could get around that is doing a single-legged split squat. With a, you can add a weight to that. You can add a band to that. Um, you can add a rucksack to that with a weight in the rucksack. Um, for the majority of the last few months since spinal fusion surgery, I've not been able to do any of those lifts um, to any degree, um, but I have been able to do some bodyweight squats and some leg press movements. You can try some static contraction training. Um, Jerome Armstrong actually did an interesting explanation of that on my channel. I think it was maybe Friday. Well, maybe it was Monday, actually. Uh, it was last Monday, um, eight days ago, 20th of March. 
Um, and he just explained how to do a static contraction lift using basically a big band. Um, you can get it gives, gives you a good workout. It's probably not going to be as good as doing a proper workout in a gym. But if you're going through hip replacement, you'll be grateful to do anything. As as was I when I was able to do some workout in the gym. So I can relate to you there, and hopefully you'll find something that works out. What do you guys think? I would focus more on isolation movements, extensions, leg curls, and I wouldn't press the machines. I think you're cutting out a bit, Mark. Is it the same? Thing you, as you could do step up on the. You hear me now? I can hear I can you now. It just cuts out. I'm not sure if it's the same for Colt. Yeah, I was I was hearing them cut out a little bit too. Yeah. Yeah, you said it's breaking. I said that. Yeah, it's breaking. I'll throw a few cents worth, and then and 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 then when yeah. I'm done, uh, hopefully that yeah. fixes it. Yeah. Hey, 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 Mark. I'm gonna throw my two cents worth, and then after that, yeah, um Hopefully, ho hopefully, whatever's not working works. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. I was I was just gonna say. Uh, yeah. Ask ask me in five years from now. And I'll probably have had a hip replacement by then with the rate I'm going with these injuries. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, no, I, I just don't, I just don't have any, any, anything to add there. Um, I haven't had personal experience with anyone that has had a hip injury. So I'm going to, I'm going to defer to both of your expert opinions. <laughs> can you hear me now? Mark, yeah. Yeah. I can hear you better. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh yeah. So oh, basically, yeah. what I was saying, I would I would focus more isolation movements like leg extensions, leg curls, abductors, abductors, maybe some body weight lunges. I'd look at that. I'd look at that kind of stuff first. See what's like, and um, body weight squats. And I wouldn't put any loads on the body. Um, I think that if you start putting a lot of load on the body, that can have a major hip. Um, so I'd strengthen up the legs. Definitely up the lower. I think adding in the abductors and abductors help the hip as well going forward. Um, but I would give it a bit of time. I'd give it a few, give it a few weeks, give it a few months, ease your way back into it nice and slowly. As I said, add some body weight squats. If you are going to be using a leg press, I wouldn't go down too low. Maybe a half a rep down, a half a rep up. Um, or what you could do is just don't load it up too much and just focus on bringing the weight down as low as you possibly can. And if you feel any niggles whatsoever, then it's going to hit down too low. And then every week, feel comfortable. Just don't. Good shout. Yeah. I think Mark's cut out a bit now. Um, I'll add something. So unless anything, Mark has anything later to say, just say it after this little, little piece. Um, I'll probably use the movements you're weaker in first so Jay, you've listed bulgarian split squat goblet squat and hip thrust i'll probably look at using the hip thrust first as like a pre-exhaust in a way then maybe the split squat then the goblet squat so work from the weakest less intensive movement to the more challenging movement um it's basically the same as pre-exhausting, so by the sounds of it, you don't have access to like abductor machines, leg extensions, all that sort of thing. So you could try that. Um, if you wanted something more informative, that's a video. I do have a mini-series. It's something like spinal fusion workouts on my channel. Um, they're not the same as a hip um, sort of issue, but these videos will be useful to you. They'll show you how to do things, the right cadence, what to look out for. You'll, you'll see how I do it, and that'll be useful to you to see, because... Um, my hips are, well, my right hip is absolutely messed up right now. But I've man managed to improve it over time and work way around it. So I've not had um, a hip replacement yet, but I feel as if I need one. So I can relate to you there in terms of uh, dealing with injuries uh, around the hip joint. Good stuff, guys. Yeah, hey, the only point I, I would I say... I just, I just want to say, Nathan, thanks a lot for your... I just want to say thanks a lot for your, for your, for your comment, um, Nathan. <laughs> and thanks a lot, Jay, Jerome, everybody for joining. Appreciate you guys for hopping in. 
All right. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead, Mark. Oh my gosh, Chrissy. Cool. Um, no. I was just, gonna, I was just going to go over your macros here in a little bit, actually, but I wasn't going to say your name. I guess I just did. Thanks for joining. Hey guys. Uh, so Chrissy is um, a brand new carnivore bodybuilder and she's just getting uh, dial dialed in for her first show. Um, she's, she's lean. She's super, super lean, probably about like four or five, four or five um, weeks away from just being able to step on stage right now as a bikini athlete. So anyway, um, everybody's got to go follow Chrissy if you haven't, if, if, if you, if you don't know who she is, but uh, her and her husband, Adam, super, super cool people. Um, and they're going to be doing a show in August in Nevada. Um, and I think it's around the 20th. So you can say, you can say my name, LOL. Okay, great. <laughs> I always like to ask to make sure and make sure that I have permission. Thank you. Th thanks a lot for that. Um, cool. So we got another, so we, so we got another question. Oh, um, if, if, if hey, Chrissy, you should, you should comment your, your Instagram in there. So people know, um, where to find you, if you would, please. Um, Mark, would you want to finish what you're saying? Sorry. Cause I, yeah, yeah. I, th I think you, you had a good, really good point to make that I, I didn't quite um, catch it. Yeah, so basically what I was saying, when it comes to like the the hip, I wouldn't be a big fan of doing any pressing whatsoever because that's going to put an awful lot of pressure on the hip. I would be focusing on stretching the areas around that first. So let's go focus more on um, extension movements, like leg extension, then we can go for a leg curl, have um, or our leg, our leg abduction machine, that can work absolutely amazing as well. Um. I think it, when it comes to leg pressing, I think if you go down too deep, especially with a heavy load, you're you're in you're in line for a lot of trouble there. So I would say if you are in, if you want to do like um, squatting movements, I'd be doing them like body weight. So I'd be like put a chair on the ground, like a small chair, sit on, and then you stand back up. See how that feels. If that feels really really good then you can take it on to the next stage. You might, you might, uh, but what I would do is I would take the lower back out of it. So I wouldn't do any squat movements. I wouldn't do any RDLs. And I'd probably go into a safe exercise, like check the leg, leg, leg press, see how your flex, see how your flexibility is. See if you can go down deep. If you can't go down deep, well then I would take that out. I would just focus more on the isolation movements for the next couple of weeks, straighten the areas of force. And then I'm pretty sure then, and the next couple of weeks, then it'll get a lot better. Because I think the more, if you want the muscle to heal, it just I am. I believe that if you want, in order for you to get um, better faster, just take time off. Take a little bit of time off. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean you can stop doing legs. As I say, you can still do legs. You can do lunges, bodyweight lunges. You can do bodyweight squats. You can, you can work on your leg extensions. You can work on your leg curls. You know, I mean, there are other ways of building your legs. Just like what how I personally take the pressing movements out of um, the program at the moment. Good shout. Yeah, it's not the be one end all. Thanks for that. Yeah, Mark. Um, Chris, Chris, Chris. <laughs> go ahead. I just want to. Okay, I just want to say that Chrissy wanted to add to that. Um, if you have a hip impingement, you want to avoid deep hip flexion. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Focused more on hip extension. So she um, she, she actually specializes in uh, correctional training. And I was like, th this this is actually um, where she um, th this this is her area of expertise. Um, I just want to throw one more one more thing out there too. Um, something that helps that helps me to focus more on my legs in general and even glutes without uh, feeling as much pressure on my hips is a leg press with uh, more of a with more of a close stance and actually a pigeon toed. Um, a pigeon toed leg position, which is where your heels are a little further apart and toes are a little closer together, kind of pointed together and like the shape of a pizza or like a triangle. Um, and it's, it, it causes more strain on the, on, on the knees, but it helps me activate my side laterals more. So that's what I'm, so that, that's what I'm, um, you know, trying, trying to hit typically, but it hits the entire legs. It's a great compound exercise. Um, and I get a lot of glute activation with it too but it feels way, way easier on the hips just personally. So that's kind of a staple for me. I, 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 and I, I have, I, I do have hip injuries too. So that's always something that I'm, you know, trying to work around. Um, just this one last point. Sorry guys. Um, 
I'm conscious of time. We've got about 20 minutes left, so we'll probably be able to get through about two more questions. I know, now um, they're all piling up too. <laughs> yeah, so my friend Jerome Armstrong, he's currently live in the chat right now. Um, I just remembered he's going to be posting a video on, um, basically of his one of his clients training, doing some sort of leg workout, and she had hip surgery. So it's very much up Joe Street, and Jerome is, his expertise is personal training people with um, severe injuries, people, you know, rehab, people that are elderly. So that'll be quite an informative video. So if you're not subscribed, please subscribe and check out that video. It'll probably be out by around about the end of this week or maybe a bit later. So that'll be an informative cool. yep. kind of video. I'll watch that. You know, you'll see him. You'll see him see do it. Yep. Perfect. Um, so Carl had a question. Thoughts on good quality plain marine worth the money? I know it's not so rule, which is what um, Bart K advocates and endorses. When they get rid of the sucralose and sucrose, I would buy it. Don't tell Bart that. Um, yeah. So marine collagen itself, I believe, is one type of collagen. So there's different peptides within collagen which makes it collagen. So you can have collagen peptide one, two, three, or four, something like that. Um, now, I understand what people are coming from with this sucralose, sucrose thing, you know. Um, sucralose being an artificial sweetener, sweet taste, stimulate insulin. Sucrose stimulates insulin, rises blood glucose prior to that. Um, what people don't realise, which I don't think Bart's ever made this point, but collagen in itself is rich in glycine. And glycine is an insulogenic amino acid. So effectively, it does the same thing. Um, so it'd be like having something that does um, induce some level of blood glucose increase, and adding like a tiny fraction extra onto it. Now, if you're talking about the gut microbiome, how that might be affected by those sort of things, I'm, it's probably a different story. But if you're concerned about the insulin release from these things, I wouldn't be concerned about it. Um, if you are looking to buy a collagen product anyway, um, as for marine collagen, I think you can just use bone broth. Um, I endorse a bone broth powder from the UK. I don't think you're from the UK, but there are ones out there that are organic um, without sort of additives to them. That would be rich in collagen. Um, it'd probably be a better whole food source because it has potassium and other electrolytes in it. So I'd go for the more whole food form of it. Now, if you're more of a purist, you just want a pure collagen powder on its own. Um, there's different things you can take. Look at something that's not synthesized in China, um, but you often have added things to it, which makes it just crap. Um, quality control and quality assurance is very important. Um, the UK does produce the best quality supplements in the world by a mile. Um, I know that because of the legislation that we have over here. Um, the FDA restriction is quite lax in the US. Um, that tends to overhaul what a lover of what a lot of other countries have as well in terms of strict testing for products. Um, you'll not often find a product that is nine, over 99% pure if you're looking at a single ingredient product. So what I'm basically saying here is that you'll never be perfect in terms of getting what you want unless you know exactly what you're looking for and know your supplier directly. Um, so it's a tricky ask, but my take on it, it could be useful, but if you're eating collagenous rich meat, you'll probably get the same benefit. Um, so rules a slightly different product because it has more than one active peptide chain, if you will, of collagen in it. So, you know, that's that's my two cents on mm -hmm. collagen anyway. Good yeah, stuff. so I, I was going to basically just say the same thing. Like if you're getting everything, if you're getting everything from your food and your diet, then you don't. I would definitely because there are. Not, Sorry, Mark, you're cutting out. Cole, do you want to interject at all? You know what? I didn't have a lot to add on this topic, but I got another question, not, not to switch gears. Um, if Mark, if your connection comes back any better, um, we'll let you know because we can see you're basically frozen. Um, if you go to the next question, then we can come back to it with Mark. Okay. So Jules, um, she's on Instagram as well, – she, she's a comedian. 
um, fit girl jewels, just like it sounds. You should check this gal out on Instagram. She's got a great physique too. Um, so she would like to ask, um, in, in autism, <laughs> I'm hoping that I'm pronouncing this correctly. In autism. Yeah. Yeah. Are you guys familiar with this? I've never heard of it before. And if I look like I'm distracted, I've been, I've been researching it and I'm still confused. Apparently it's used for film for, for, a, as a film prop. Um, it's cause it looks like cocaine. <laughs> It's a, it's a it's a B vitamin cofactor kind of thing. Um, I've used these things before in the past, and I didn't notice any benefit. Uh, I don't think I've met anyone that does notice benefit, but they do put it in energy drinks, so perhaps it is useful. What's what, what's it supposed to be used for? It's just, a, I believe, a cofactor for B vitamins, so it makes you use more of the energy from the food that you're taking in. Oh, okay. Mark, have you ever heard of it or used it? Seen it? Okay. Never, so never heard of it. Never heard of it. Yeah, this is this is this is new for me too. So apparently, Perks apparently in a health food shop with several thousand products. Yeah, it's probably one of those things where it's one of those if, things. Yeah. You're not really going to know until you try it, but there's no science that says that it does work. So if I was if I was like if I was on a competition prep, I'd consider it. <laughs> is do you guys take any supplements that you that you don't even know if they work, but you kind of hope that they do? Like topical fat burners and stuff like that? No, I know what did work, and that was um, Jack Friedman. I did years ago. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Um, we got a question from I used, to, I, used, I used to take that. Uh, we, we got a question from Mark. Hey, uh, for, excuse me, from... You know what? Yeah, you're you're cutting out, cutting out in and out a little bit, brother. And 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 whenever you do, I just kind of ask the next question <laughs> because I don't know what else to do. Mark, what we'll Sorry. try doing is, Mark, if you could um turn your video off, maybe if that's possible, that might reduce the bandwidth so we can actually hear you, which is more important. If that if that's possible, you're in. I don't know. Okay. So um, Matt would like to ask, how often should you sw uh, switch up rep ranges? Jonathan, you want to take that one? Um, how often we should? Well, right. I don't see I'll go, I'll go ahead and do that. Just, I'll, go ahead and, I'll go ahead and do it while you're trying to get Mark squared away. Okay, you care. You care. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, so when it comes to rep ranges, bro, the, the, way, the way that I uh, generally go about it, right now my, my, my training is – basically working around injuries and just kind of training whatever's not hurt right now. Um, and I, I, I try, I try to live most of my, my, my life, not like that. <laughs> um, but typically it's um, the, the way, the way that I would program a beginner would be all the rep ranges the same for about three or four weeks, three or four weeks is going to give you enough time to be able to see some results. And so if you're, if, if you're, if you're not seeing, bigger bicep peaks if you're not seeing um the the muscle the muscle growth that you want to see after three weeks get a give it another week after that fourth week you should be seeing progress if not then take a step back and something's not and, and so, something's not working properly either you're not consuming enough protein knowing you you're a carnivore and so i know that you that that, that you are um if you're um, you, you need to have sleep and you need to have water and you need to have a stimulus. Those are the only four things that you need to build muscle. So rep ranges is part of the stimulus category, right? That's how you're signaling your body um, that your muscles need to grow. That's something to where, in my in my experience, three or four three or four weeks after that is when I start seeing diminishing returns. So if I'm on the fifth week and I'm and, and I'm doing bicep curls with an easy bar for ten reps. Um, it's just going to stop working eventually. And you know that, and that's why you're asking the question. So, uh, so to answer your question, that's kind of the sweet spot. And then from there, it depends on, it depends on what your goal is. Um, if you've been, if you're an advanced athlete and you've been training a while, then your then your then your bicep training is going to look different. It's going to be more advanced. It's going to be a bit more complicated than it was when you first started. The basics will get you, the basics will only get you so far. It's, especially if you're a natural athlete, it's, it's just you can only progressively overload so far and then you have to start making it guess. You have to start doing yep, you, you have to start doing um, different variations of preacher curls and adding drop sets in. And you get to a point to where you're like, OK, 
what has what have my arms not done yet that would give that would totally confuse them and give my reason to grow let's do that for a couple of weeks right um lately for me it's been a lot of blood flow restriction i'm trying to um minimize compound lifts working around the cracked rib and uh my stress fractured foot right now so uh blood flow restriction has been has been huge for me it's been really really helpful um other <laughs> other 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 rep range schemes that I'm doing right now um, is a lot of drop sets, a lot of time under tension, and I'm trying and I'm trying to keep and I'm trying to keep everything around 45 seconds to 60 seconds of time under tension if I can. Um, if I'm in the lower rep ranges for something to where I'm focusing more on strength and that's what my body is telling me is working, then great. I'm going to spend more time in that rep range. Um, but I'm going to try to keep those eight reps around 45 seconds, especially after talking with, um, especially after, after talking with Bart is, 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 is just that you don't need to, you don't need to be into that 15, 20 crazy rep range to be able to, to, to be able to signal for your muscles to grow. Um, generally speaking, eight to 12 reps, 15 reps for me, and, and as high as 20 reps when it comes down to legs, cause they're a bigger muscle group those are the rep ranges that i usually try to 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 um to live in and then but there, but there's but there's days where where, where my where my body's like you know what um I'm, I'm 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 just feeling like lifting heavy i'm just feeling like i'm i'm just feeling really really strong today those are kind of the days to capitalize on it and throw and throw your plan out the window do your do your heavy day and then that's and then, and then that's less heavy work that you have to do <laughs> later in the week if that's in your training program I'm just throwing out ideas and, and, and when it when it comes to um i don't know i guess i guess how my, my training's been lately fair enough yeah it's it's all a big thought process guys so we're not going to prescribe to anyone to do six repetitions or 20 or 30. Yeah. um the reality is when we're actually training we're never going to be exact it should be we're training close to failure or at failure in mm -hmm. terms of concentric muscular failure from one week to the next, it could be eight repetitions or nine. Or if you're doing 20 reps, it could be 19 or 20 or, you know, any sort of um, permutation around that. Um, I'd say I cannot or would and would not actually give an exact um, flow chart of when someone should change the repetition scheme. Um, I know that most of my clients will have a preferred amount of repetitions that they're going to do. Um, so people like Bart and myself and perhaps Mark as well, we all kind of promote the idea that we have to do the minimum effective volume the mm -hmm. minimum dose to get the most effect yeah um that's assuming that you can recover from whatever that is so if you're doing say six to eight repetitions which is about as low as i'll go um, i might find on certain movements my elbows might play up my shoulders might play up in which case once i spot that in my training routine i then dissect why that's happened is it because my the shearing fault on my shoulders is too much or my elbows too much? Is it because I'm doing too much weight? Is it because the form is bad itself? Is it because the exercise itself is bad for me because of my, my build, my structure? Um, by that point, this these sort of things you'll pick up over time. So we're not going to give you a directive here. Or I'm not anyway. Um, but you'll, you'll learn this about yourself over time. So for me, I can load my calves with all the weight and then some on the machines. Um, I can work that safely. My calf, my Achilles tendon lets me do that just fine. Um, my biceps, I can load quite a lot. My elbows are a bit problematic. Um, my knees are actually perfect for lifting very heavy, but my back isn't. Um, and assuming you have good back, then sometimes you've got good knees as well, then you can lift heavy in the leg movements. For me, for myself, um, it's not my knees that are the problem area. So my lower back is the problem area because I've had spinal fusion. So my training will be evolved around that. So, for example, I might, like I did today, do lower intensity and higher volume, almost almost to kind of make up for that lack of intensity um, in my back workout. And the same would be true for my leg workout. However, I don't have the same issues with my hips and lower back that I do as as with what I have with, for example, my, my, my elbows. My elbows seem to be quite fine. So I can do pressing movements very heavy in like the six to eight rep range or a bit higher. And I don't have any issues doing that. I can do it for a long time. So weeks and weeks and weeks and end. Um, I don't, like I just said, I don't believe in prescribing 
uh, miso cycles. That's something you'll come across at some point in your training career. And that that basically that idea is basically you do a block of time where it's you know four to six weeks mm. of heavy, four to six weeks of light, four to six whatever it is. Uh, I think you'll find the answer over time, and I think the best way to do that is trial and error. I don't think there's going to be an exact way you need to do it in terms of repetitions. Um, I'll say as my general guideline, which I give to everyone, um, based on my own experience and what I see virtually everyone doing online and in person, six to 20 repetitions per set. Um, the caveat of that is that if you're doing six repetitions or 20 or anything in between, that the repetition amount that you're aiming to hit is at or very close to muscular failure. That's how you know you're giving your body that stimulus to actually develop from that point. So look at it as a cause for, look at it in a way that you're going to find, okay, what is the missing factor? What what can I denominate from my training to work out what I need to do next? Is it my elbows bad? Is it my recovery is bad? So put all this together and into a big matrix of information to work out. That is exactly what you can do in your next workout. So that's probably the best way I'd go about it. Um, he's got some more questions in the chat as well. So about exercise variations and how would someone progress or struggle with deep squatting, mobility work or lower weight in order to master movement? I'd work first and foremost on mobility work um, and focus on acting, activating your working muscles at that given point in the movement. So if you have issues with mobility, so for example, you can't squat deep in a repetition, you're not going to be flinging yourself to the floor to force yourself into that deep position. It has to be your muscles allow you to get in that position. So don't rush anything. Um, now, you don't have to go into a deep squat to develop your muscles maximally. Um, I know myself and a lot of other people, you know, I tend to go right down there, but that's because my body lets me. Other people will do 90 degree in terms of thigh to shin squats. So basically, if you're sitting down on a chair near enough, and they'll develop just as much quad growth as someone doing the extra 20, 30 degrees. So... I wouldn't focus too much on being perfect with all your repetitions in terms of range of motion. Um, and what I would recommend you do, actually, I know you're speaking a bit with Colt um, off air, is perhaps if Colt has time, um, you know, I, I don't know what, what Colt does for clients, but perhaps actually send your workout footage to Colt. He'll look at it, analyse it and say, this is good, this is bad. That's the best way to know. I know most people that I see train, 95% of them that I see train in the gym, don't train effectively, yeah, shoot me. don't train well or safely. Shoot me an email, bro. Colt at supersetyourlife.com. I'll take a look at it. Yeah, it's probably best, but um, Mark, do you have anything to say about that if you're still here? In regards to training and rep ranges? Yeah. So... My take on this is different to you guys because I'm a little bit older. So um, when it comes to like the likes of reps and sets like that, I don't really focus on that too much. Um, I find that muscle doesn't know anything about reps and sets. The muscle only knows everything about tension. Um, but yeah. I will work in different reps on different exercises. So I will never go with a particular amount of um, reps I'm doing with the exercise. I will just go until the muscle completely fails. So that could be 6, 8, 10, 12. But I will stop between 12 and 15. The reason for that is it's just because I'm a little bit older. Like I'm I'm like three years off my 50th. So obviously my training has to be a little bit different to you guys. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure when you guys are that older as well, you'll be looking at training a little bit differently yourself. And you'll, you'll see for yourself that when it comes to the like the 8, 10, the 8, 10, 12 rep ranges, you'll probably need a little, little bit more just to keep it on your joints. Um, I'm at a situation now where I want to keep everything healthy. Um, I'm not doing anything to look a certain way. I don't want to damage anything. Um, I think that's a, that's, a, that's another good reason why I've always had longevity in the sport. Um, I've never considered going extremely heavy. I've never, I've never um, went... I looked at a video and said, right, he's doing eight reps. I need to do eight reps. I always just focused on what, what am I doing? Am I progressing over time? Am I getting stronger over time? Um, and that's it. That's pretty much it. So when I'm doing, let's, let's say if I'm doing like a push session, I might do two heavy sets, like two heavy sets and two different exercises. So I might do that for a dumbbell press. And then I might do that for, say, just a, um, 
I might do it for like an incline uh, hammer strip machine. Then after that, then that's when I'll increase the reps in the next exercise. So I might do a pec deck or I might do a dip. And this is where I would add more of a rest pod set. So this is where I would take the set to failure. Again, I wouldn't be focused on reps. I'd just focus on tension on the muscle. But I'd be only resting for about about maybe two to five seconds. Going back in, try and get one or two more reps. Five seconds again and go straight back in and, and try and finish that last rep. But on that last rep, I'm not really focusing on contracting the muscle. I'm really focusing on the negative part of the, part of the muscle. Because I know on the very, very last rep, if I really, really focus on that negative part, I've literally taken, I've taken that muscle to complete another failure. Perfect, yeah. Um, I'm going to I'm going to say one thing before we go to the very last question, which Colt has. Um, I've built most of my muscle with around 50 to 20 repetitions. Not six, not eight. But yeah, I've trained I'm the same. With that repetition range hard. So like hard 15 yeah. to 20 reps, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think if you if you could I'm I'm with think you, bro. Yeah. I think if you I think I think if you can do an exercise safely for twelve to fifteen reps, I think it's it's much better. Now I can understand I can understand what people say when it comes to strengths and stuff like that. Um but I, I, I honestly believe if you can let's say if you're doing a leg press, if you do twelve if you do fifteen to twenty repetitions on that exercise. You're not going to be able to walk off that machine. Seriously. Like, there's a, there's a massive difference between skip, between strength and taking that muscle to complete another failure when your legs are absolutely shaking. Shaking to the point where you have to crawl off that machine. Crawl off the machine. It's a, it's a terrible feeling, but it's a wonderful feeling. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Cool, cool. All right. Uh, it's okay if we wrap up with this last one, bro? We'll do this last one. Joe's got um, another question, but that'll have to wait for next time, I think. Okay. Um, so I can take it away with this last one then? Green light? Yeah, sure. Go for it. All right, all right. All right. Cool. So so this is Chrissy. She's going to be... Uh, so she's 18 weeks out right now. I wanted to run this one by both of you guys, okay? Um, she's currently about 12% body fat, 100 grams, uh, 120 grams of protein, 120 grams of fat is what she's consuming right now. No carbs, and she's five foot two. Um and so she does not need to lose basically any weight right now or be any leaner. I mean, she already has pretty decent abs to the point to where if she had any better ab definition, she'd probably get knocked down for it. She would be too hard. So, uh, I mean, this, this is like perfect case scenario, right? So my thought process is keep her protein at 120 and gradually increase to 200 taking a close look at her weight and her body composition make sure that doesn't make her any softer keep that strategy going up through uh about four weeks out and then start thinking about refeeds but she may not even need them at that point we should no no never mind we need to we need to do refeeds so that we can get her peaking protocol down so we'll start that anyway about four weeks out um but i'm just seeing a huge opportunity for her to grow all the way through this show not sure if you guys have any more thoughts on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first just so we know that I've gone then. Mark will go immediately after because I can't see him, of course. Um, I wouldn't have a goal macro amount in mind, so I wouldn't be looking at thinking, okay, we're, we're at 150 pro team, we're going to go up to one to, up to 200. Mm -hmm. I'd just I'd literally play it by year. So we'd be up to 160, give it a week. You know, there's no point dieting yourself to a pulp if you're already in shape. Um, at the same point, there's no point um, shooting for a number at the risk or expense of undershooting your goals. If that makes sense. Um, okay. So I'd, just, I'd, I'd play it by ear. So I wouldn't ignore the 200. It might get to 200 or more. You know, you never know until you get to that point. But, um, we'll yeah, just, that, just, and, and that, that, was just, that was just a ballpark. I wasn't saying that that's the goal is to get her to that number exactly. But just like, I don't know, somewhere okay. around that is kind of the idea is to get her a, yeah. a, 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 around that area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So start at one fifty. Add, add maybe ten grams a week or something, or every few days. Okay. Um, so, so, so track them. Gestium. Okay. So so track them and take it one day at a time. Obviously, but start with one twenty protein since that's what she's doing and that's what she's feeling great on and looking great on right now. And then the fats are just going to go up ten pounds every single week. Okay. That's pretty. That's pretty easy. I mean, this is a lot yeah. simpler than how than how I would normally do it, but it's just. 
I don't know what to do since she's like literally stage ready right now. <laughs> you know, most people are are, yeah. are like 24 weeks out. And then that, that and then that's like, okay, you're gonna get fat adapted, you're gonna go through this phase, that phase, blah, blah, blah. But um Yeah, it yeah, doesn't have to be this, this, this um different. this complicated, I don't think. It just add play it by yeah, take ten grams of each every few days. Um pay t- close attention to her sleep, recovery, bowel movements, digestion. Cool, cool. All the fun things. I know. What do you think, Mark? <laughs> Mark, you there, pal? Yeah, I'm here. Cool. What What did you call us earlier today over email? Chaps. That, <laughs> I've never been called chap before. I like it, though. That, that's, a, that's what they say in England. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Chaps. Yeah, we that say bro chaps. over here. <laughs> I've got, I've got, I've got one or two cl- one, one or two clients in in England. One one lives in Birmingham and one lives in um, in Wolves. And the time they get on to me, they always send me a message saying, "Hello, chap." <laughs> so I don't know whether it's a big thing over in England, but they always say to me the first thing, "Hello, chap. How are you, chap?" I can never understand the Birmingham accent ever. <laughs> That's the hardest one, guys. Super funny. They cool. speak very, very cool. fast. <laughs> I think for wrapping up, then um, maybe we should maybe we should just let everybody know that next Tuesday at twelve thirty Pacific time, that is U.S. Pacific time, if you're on the West Coast, um, we'll be here again answering all your questions. And that is eight thirty p.m. if you are in the U.K. or in Ireland. You guys have any other closing thoughts that you wanted to leave everyone off with? No, just having a lovely time. Um, enjoy to speak to you guys, getting different viewpoints and different understandings of... Oftentimes we agree, but sometimes we disagree. But it's always good to expand our repertoire of information, understand why someone might think differently to you. Um, it doesn't mean it's the wrong answer at all. It just means it's a different viewpoint from a different experience. So thank you very much, guys. Absolutely. Cool. See everybody, see everybody next next week at uh, 12.30 p.m. again. Um I just wanted this. I just wanted to tell both. Oh, um, Jonathan, where can people go to find you, bro? Other than here on on your YouTube channel. Here's um, a good place to find me on my website, compositionconsultant.com. Or the way to find me is Instagram, which is composition underscore consultant. Yeah, buddy. And then Mark, you, sir? Yep. You can find me on Instagram. That's where I'm there. I'm there pretty much all the time. Uh, fitness be a downtime. Cool, cool. And he's cutting out a little bit there, so we're going to plug that in the show notes as well. You can find me on Instagram at Colt Milton, C O L T M I L T O N, and uh, supersetyourlife.com. Going to send everybody off with this. Oh, and you know what? No, I wanted to tell both of you guys just man to man, bro to bro, pal to pal, chap to chap. <laughs> Uh, Proverbs twenty seven seventeen, one of my favorite verses. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Literally translated, actually, is one man sharpens another's faith. <laughs> but yeah, no, I just want to just want to thank both of you for being in my life and for being and for being people that. Um, I mean, you guys are kind of the closest thing to to, to have as coaches right now is you guys, and uh, you're 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 holding me accountable to my diet, my goals for this year, and and and, and vice versa. I mean, half the half the fun of doing these lives is just for all of us to be able to catch up and see how we're doing because we're all super busy uh, and with, with our, yeah. with our own business that we're doing. So anyway, I just want to say thanks. These are a real a pain for us guys to, um, those in the chat, these are real pain for us to actually organize and get across the right time. And we will yeah. have very different schedules, very different days and collaborating like this is oh my um, gosh, challenging, yeah. but we managed to do it. That's what's important. Le- yeah. Last, last night, um, I, I, I interviewed, uh, Steven, the UK carnivore, um, and it, and when we were an hour off and I was like, I triple checked, there's no way that I was wrong. And he's like, I triple checked. And, and we were like, oh, um, they had daylight savings time. You guys did, Jonathan. We did. And I did. Same thing yeah. happened to me today, but I, I yeah. checked in on the day in advance. Yeah. See, and, mm. and so I, and, and so we, we had, a, <laughs> I talked about on, on the podcast that we were recording, actually, we had, had another meeting the exact same time and, um, and, and just, had to make it work. Had to make it happen. So anyway, that's a different story. But yeah, no, cool. I just want to say thank both of you for making it work and for and for and for everybody hopping on 
Um, lots of really good questions today. Thanks a lot. Cool. We'll catch you guys next no week. No problem. <laughs>